Welcome back to the Stigma Podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Hayes, and this episode is probably the most important one we've done. In this episode, we're talking about entrepreneur mental health. Our guest, Matthew Cooper, stepped down from his role as CEO of EarnUp after growing the business successfully for seven years. When he stepped down, he cited mental health as the primary driver, and he wrote this incredibly authentic, vulnerable, and amazing blog post about his decision on December 18th, 2020. When I read that post, I found myself in his story. I was literally brought to tears because of how much of what he's been through sounded just like what I've lived through. Your effort and the efforts of those who share their stories do so much to destigmatize mental health, to normalize prioritizing our mental health, to normalize asking for help, talking about it, and what you've done will pave the way for so many others. So I just wanted to say thank you for setting an example and, and as I call it, leaving the light on for other founders so that they know that it's okay to ask for help. Well, thank you, Stephen, so much for having me on. And uh, I feel very similarly, I mean, both about the similarities and some aspects of our story and experience and also just the kind of critical importance uh, now more than ever of creating spaces to like destigmatize and create room for people just to identify when they have challenges and what can be done to get more support. So I'm excited to be here. I'd love to start with having you share a little bit about your story and your journey of being an entrepreneur and you're dealing with some of the struggles you've dealt with and then and then ultimately, you know, how how you got to the point where where you sought help and I think it would be really helpful for our audience to kind of just get to hear hear your backstory a little bit. Yeah, for sure. You know, I'll start maybe at the end and then kind of walk through some of the pieces and we can go in whatever direction you think is helpful. Uh, so the kind of most recent piece of my career was choosing to step down from being CEO of a company that I founded seven years ago called EarnUp, which is in the fintech financial technology sector, helping consumers improve their financial lives and get out of debt. And uh, after seven years, kind of as CEO of that business, decided to step down really to prioritize my mental health and get better. And that part of part of getting better for me was that transition. So that's the life I'm living in now is sort of, it's very different than the one I had a few months ago. By way of background, you know, I grew up, I'll kind of go through a few things here. You know, I grew up uh, in a few different places, but a big chunk of that was in Vancouver, Canada. And for me, I think the mental illness threads, which started to be most pronounced for me, started when I becoming really obvious when I was probably I, around 11 or 12. And that's when I started having what I would now identify as really extreme periods of anxiety as well as periods of depression. And for me, those generally were kind of separate episodes that would go back and forth. Uh, it was also around that time that more compulsive activities and actions in my life became more prevalent. One of those was eating disorders, which initially was, you know, under eating chronically, which I kind of categorize as anorexia, as well as like overeating and purging, which, you know, we identify as bulimia. So that became more prevalent at the exact same time. And so did a predisposition to just trying to win at everything. And that was sort of a dualism, a workaholism, this compulsive doing and being good at the things around me. I kind of set the stage only in that that was kind of the age that I really can remember in hindsight that all of these things sort of took off at the same time. Now, you know, mental health, as well as some of these just like what you know, later would become very unhelpful tools and coping mechanisms. And, you know, fast forward, did a bunch of stuff in my life. You know, I'm 38 years old now. So there's a long way between that and 11. Uh, you're 12 years old. But coming into, you know, my, I kind of plowed through uh, high school and college you know, getting a bunch of awards, winning a bunch of stuff in all different areas, you know, school and, you know, sports, you know, winning national championships and this, that and whatever. And that kind of continued through college. I mean, I had a lot of beautiful experiences, but there also was this underpinning of just super high intensity 
uh, and this d- this craving that I had to perform and putting immense strain on myself to be better, go faster, achieve that next thing, whatever that next thing was. And I had a lot of things. I would rotate through time what things I was trying to, you know, be the best at, but there was always a few of them in the hopper. And so that kind of carried me through and the compulsives and the eating disorders and the anxiety and the depression, those things kind of continued to kind of almost just settled in as like, that was my, that was just how I was in the world was a little bit cut off from people and a little bit cut off from myself and getting a lot of affirmation externally for doing a lot of stuff. And my career was one where I was attracted to very high, I would say high creativity, high intensity careers. And the first place I landed after college was at McKinsey and Company, which is a global consulting firm. And that I was very attracted to that, I think, because it was prestigious. Certainly, there was a piece of me. And within that also just you had these big problems and tight timelines, you know, like I loved, there's a part of me that really enjoys and thrives, you know, on that intensity. And that was a very intense place with tons of learning and tons of community and lots of fun too, but just a high pitched environment. And I went from that after a few years into private equity which is sort of making more direct investments in companies, which I did overseas in Dubai for several years, and then uh, moved and was located in Los Angeles. So I moved around quite a lot, had, you know, uh, living overseas, living here. Through that entire time leading up to when I started my own company, uh, when I was about 30 years old, I really just had this pervasive dread, you know, that drove a lot of those actions and behaviors. And I don't, I wouldn't have been able to place that dread at the time. But in hindsight, I think there was just some piece of me that really felt like in order to survive or in order to be okay, I needed to get, you know, the next 10 things done. And I just lived off that high of the the checklist, you know, what else, what else, what else? When I was turning 30, I'd been working in LA I had an amazing job there in the private equity space with some amazing people, but I was really unhappy and that was confusing to me. I had gotten exactly in my career more or less where I thought I could get to at that point in my life and I wasn't happy. The depression was getting way worse. It was more destabilizing, debilitating. Other physical health issues were showing up just like, you know, I would get sick a lot more often, things that I had never happened before. And so I quit that job without much of a view on what I was going to do, took a few months off in LA, and then decided, I guess I'll pause there to say I quit this job after, you know, a slow rollout from the projects I was working on. And after like two weeks of not working, I was still in absolutely sort of unmanageably depressed and anxious. And I was really confused because I thought, well, I thought that that career that I was in was making me feel this way. And I was still, I was just literally, you know, sitting on the beach all day and feeling horrible. And that was the first time that I really got help. Started online, just like with some meditation classes that UCLA had, not classes, like they had some meditations recorded online that I listened to. That was like, I remember one of the first steps I got two therapists, because, you know, that's the way I rolled at that time, you know, I'm going to fix myself, I'm going to do it quickly. So I got two therapists and different modalities. I started going to a meditation group, like a program where they would sort of teach you about Buddhism and meditation. Uh, And I started going to group therapies of a few different types, then too, just checking out different group therapy environments in the LA area. So that I would just say was sort of one bookmark, which is that was what I view as sort of the start of my recovery journey was starting to get help there. And I'd been really miserable off and on for a long time before I actually was able to show up and tell people that, you know, I wasn't okay, or I didn't think I could kind of handle all of this stuff on my own. What were those signs along the way that did you recognize signs earlier on that maybe you should get help? Because for me, I think I saw those signs but I either didn't want to see them or I didn't 
process them or I thought those were just going to get in the way of me getting where I needed to go because I hadn't figured out yet that the job wasn't the problem, that, that, that I actually was the problem. It took me a really long time to figure that out. Yeah. It's such a good question and it's such a hard question to answer in that I don't want to answer, hey, these are the things I see now we're off. <laughs> like there are a million signs, but like that's the benefit of hindsight. So I'm trying to drop back into that period of my life. I will say a few things like there were people around me very worried about me for a long time, uh, mostly my family, and they would tell me they were worried about me. And that didn't register, at least not in those moments. But I have to believe potentially having people you love and care about occasionally bring up the fact that they're concerned about you or they feel like you're detached or you're cut off or you're working too hard. I still think those things plant seeds in my case, you know, and, and maybe help me get there eventually. It just took, you know, a decade plus. By the way, my parents had been worried about me and talking about how I needed to slow down since I was t- 12 years old. So this has been a longstanding conversation where I just believe they didn't get it. What did I see? So the things that At that time, later in my story, you know, suicide, really intense suicidal ideation became a scary factor, which we'll get to later, that that wasn't that led me to seek more help at a later part in my journey. But at that era, I felt the thing that really made me want to get help, a big piece of it was that I didn't know what else to do. So I changed all of these things around me but I still was miserable. And so that had been a few year process because I was like 30 when I decided to step down from the job, the, the private equity sector, or, you know, kind of quit that job. But it had started maybe like around 26 or 27. I was in severe, intense depression where I was just like laying in bed, sometimes just like binge eating sugar and like couldn't function in the world. And I'd basically go between like my bed and dysfunction. And I'm glad there really wasn't Netflix at the time, or I'm sure that would have been a big part of my story or gaming or something. But at that point, I would just like lay there. And it was just like compulsive eating, staring at the ceiling or going to work. And when I was work, I could kind of escape my body, I think, and kind of be at work and be functional and then go back to being pretty dysfunctional. Long story short is I'd been sort of in the closet and questioning my sexuality for a long time since, I don't know. I was kind of late to that game. So probably like mid to late teens in terms of like awareness, but I came out of the closet and that was a big to do. And that was very scary. That was when I was like 26, 27 progressively. And I thought that would fix everything. And I was still really bleeping unhappy. And then it was like, okay, I'm still unhappy. You know what it is? I'm in the middle East. I need to get back to like the West coast. So then I did this big fucking geographic moved back to the West Coast, I got a job in LA, it was an amazing job. And then that was, you know, that didn't fix it. And then I I quit the job. And then it was, I'd been on the beach for a few weeks and I was completely unmanageably unhappy. And so I think to me, I don't know, the signs, the misery had been there for so long. I just like didn't know what else to change. I literally was living in LA on the beach with nothing to do, but try to quote unquote, have fun. And I was didn't I like didn't know what else to change. I'd done all the big things I knew how to do. And I just wanted to feel better. I mean, honestly, at that point, and I didn't know how to do it. Yeah, I, I went through some states like that, too. I, I was in New York uh, after business school and doing investment banking. And, and I was going to Atlantic City on the weekends and gambling was out of control. My behavior was out of control. My drinking, my and using substances was out of control. And I, I thought if I moved to Texas, where I live now, if I moved to like a suburb in some less aggressive geography, that maybe all those things would go away, but they didn't. They followed me. I was the problem. One of the things I'm curious to ask you about is, you know, once you started Earn Up, from the very beginning, were you aware of difficulties or did they become worse or did they, you know, did maybe even some of these traits you had that helped you along the way? I mean, I'm, I'm listening to what you told me a minute ago about super high intensity and you want to achieve and you had to win and national titles and you wanted to be the best and you were drawn to these intense environments like McKinsey and, and private equity. So I'm imagining that all of that is really, really good for building a company. But then you also, you talked about the the constant depression and the eating disorder and the compulsive behavior. And I, I'm thinking all of that's really 
bad for trying to build a business and hire folks and build a team. So how did it work with the good and the bad weighing in on how you built your business? It's a great question. And I kind of wish my co-founder was here because I, I suspect he might have you know, his own uh, my co-founder at Earnup is Nadeem Hamsani, who's a really close friend and I'm sure would have his own perspectives from the outside looking in. Yeah. So took, you know, a few months off in LA, started all this recovery work and was kind of contemplating in the background what I might want to do next. I'll spare, it's not that salient for this discussion, but eventually coming out of that was me chatting with my friend Nadim, who I'd known for a while. We had worked together uh, in a previous job and we decided to start this company. So I think definitely things that attracted me to the startup path, you know, had similarities with the things that had attracted me to other professional careers. And at that point, I didn't have enough know with wherewithal or awareness after just a few months of therapy to know the difference. But the intensity of it, the creative energy of it, too, I, I am a very creative person. And starting a company or building companies or being part of young companies, which a lot, even the two private equity firms I've been part of were very small platforms when I joined them. Like I like that smaller, smaller teams, earlier stage stuff had kind of been something I migrated to even when I was working in other sectors. So I think as best I can look at it, having like a massive amount of just like ego drive And this very like intense obsession with like doing things well and being successful, I think can be a huge asset or I believe was a very big asset to us as a business. There's a lot to do when you start a company and it's an incredibly, you know, open-ended endeavor in terms of where things will go and the timelines. And that tenacity, I think, is a huge asset. On the other side, to some extent, I think that I could view the other things that I was dealing with, you know, the anxiety and the depression. In a weird way, I think I used work and eating disorders, and I would dabble in other things like alcohol. Never was never really a big drug person at that point, but like I would dabble in like nicotine or caffeine or like whatever or alcohol, like. I would kind of test other things out to see if they work, but like the working all the time and the binge eating and stuff, like those seem to be the things that were like my go-tos that really seemed to work and keeping this weird equilibrium that allowed me to be super productive. So while that equilibrium stayed in place, I was able to achieve a huge amount. And I don't think I was particularly happy in a lot of ways. I was very energized and part of me was super happy because I loved the work and the creativity of it and the energy of it. But other parts of me were pretty cut off and my ability to build real intimate relationships outside, you know, in the real world was also limited in a lot of ways, you know, by all of these activities and the, the, the fact that I was, when I wasn't working, I had to like sit with myself and that sitting with myself was so uncomfortable that I would try to like medicate with screens or food or whatever. You've mentioned this topic a couple of times and telling your story and just now this, this feeling of being cut off. What did that look like? Because, you know, you're a founder, you've raised some money, you've got a team around you. You're from the outside looking in, you're not lonely. You have, you have investors, you have founders, you have employees, you have customers, you have, you're not cut off, but what made you feel cut off when you appeared not to be? Well, I think that sensation of being cut off has diminished a huge amount over the last seven or eight years. That said, I think there is a baseline belief I have noticed about myself that I came into adulthood with, at least maybe childhood too, I don't know, that I have to do everything myself. And if I don't do it myself and I don't do it perfectly, then everything's going to fall apart. And I believe some part of me believes I'll die. Although that's not really a conscious, rational part. It's just like a more primal part. So I think I came sort of into adulthood, young adulthood and then adulthood. And I still have this belief. I've just gotten a lot more perspective on it over the last number of years. But that's where the isolation comes from is when you believe or I believe some part of me that I have to do everything myself that no one else can do it for me, and that no one else can really be trusted to help. 
again, like a lot of those roles have broken down. But I would say if you rewind when I was like in my 20s and going starting my 30s, that was a very unexamined belief pattern. I didn't even know I had it. It was just there. And you can be around other people, but some part of me didn't trust them. Even my co-founder, you know, in the ways that I trust him now, I wasn't capable of then. And that just means you're holding this massive amount of stress and anxiety. If you believe that you have to do everything yourself and that you're the only one that can do it right. And if you don't do it right, then everything falls apart. That's just a huge burden. And it's a very isolating burden, even if all the quote unquote reality around you, like things you described having a co-founder, having a family, having a team, having investors, like having all of these people that are cheering for you. Some part of me, it's only in the last year or two has started to really believe them and be willing to accept them and let them in fully spiritually in to like be part of the solution. It's almost like being an entrepreneur requires this set of traits that maybe come with this dark side and the environment you put yourself in creates a, a situation where you you feel like you are the one that is treading the water, keeping everybody's head above water, keeping the ship afloat. And so then when things get too hard, it feels like you can't reach out for help. Like if you say, I need help, then what happens? Because you're the one keeping the ship afloat. Is that fair? I think that's right. I mean, I think for me, I noticed there's a big shift in starting a company in that like when you're working for other people, you have that camaraderie of like you versus there's always the boss, right? And you can kind of find that joy as I'm sure you did in your iBanking sort of associate team or me at McKinsey. Like you have that sense of like being part of a pod, you know, and it's like, it's like us versus the man. And yeah, you and the man quote unquote are all the same, but you kind of have that, those peers and that joy of that community And I think when you start a company, at least my experience was like, you are the adults. Like You're the ones either as a single founder or as a co-founding team, like in our case as co-founders, like you're the ones I felt that we're the ones that need to know the answers. We're the, we're the ones that need to make sure everything is fine. And so there's a little bit of isolation in that too, that feels different than when you're just part of an organization it's really energizing and it's super fun to be in charge and it's fun to be the adult in the room, be able to make those decisions too. Like it's just, it's a double-edged sword. I mean, I hear what you're saying around, I think that if you look at, I haven't studied founders on mass, but the ones I know well, most of which are in the kind of tech sector in the United States, I think there's this sort of mixed bag of traits of like the ego drive and the energy and tenacity to sort of get something going and moving. It's almost like it's good until it's not. And it's like when the solution becomes the problem, (laughs) as we talk about in a lot of environments, like then it's like the world goes flips upside down. And I think that was my experience a little bit with, mental health stuff, it started like my mental health, especially the anxiety and the depression, especially strains of the anxiety that would then start to go into these suicidal periods that started several kind of growing through it's especially the last, like I would say three years. So I had a few years there where I kind of had the ship together I was working a lot of therapy this whole time running EarnUp. So I had therapy, group therapy, one-on-one therapy. I started trying medications like with a psychiatrist. Like I started, I was in a weird way doing this startup stuff and struggling with my mental health and also getting increasing amounts of support and awareness. So that's kind of this weird tandem for me that they were going kind of side by side. Why did it get to this point then? Because, you know, I, I... Here's why I want to ask this question, because I see a lot of these investors out there that are saying, I'm going to pay for founder therapy and I'm going to, they're virtue signaling, saying they're going to do something positive for founders. And look, I'm happy that they're doing it, but I've never thought that just paying for someone to go to therapy is the answer. There's got to be some other answer. What would have helped you get real help? What would have helped you avoid the emergency room? What would have helped you avoid inpatient? What would have helped you? Could you have been helped? I'm probably not even asking the right questions. I just, I'm seeing myself in your story. I'm wondering about my own experience and I'm wondering about yours. I'm just wondering, like, what, how do we help people? Yeah. I mean, I guess one thing I'll just say, I feel like to the people who may be out there who 
is just like seek whatever help you're capable of asking for at that time. Like I, you know, and I, I try to answer your question, you know, about my experience, but I just want to make sure people don't feel like, I don't believe there's a gold standard. I think that recovery work and mental health recovery and addiction recovery and all of these things, I believe are a process and have myriad ways that people get to health. And some people never get to health, right? Their lives end tragically and early. And, you know, there's been some of that in the press recently. So I think that to your question of like, I'll maybe just maybe it'd be helpful to just talk about the stuff I was doing. Yeah, I'd love to hear about the stuff you were doing. I'd love to I think there's some there's some component of stigma here. I think a lot of entrepreneurs feel like they can't reach out for help for for various reasons, some of it's stigma. So I'd I'd love to I, I really like to kind of paint the picture of what you were doing and then maybe get into why you didn't do more or what you could have done or what you could have done differently. I love that. Yeah, that sounds like a good approach to me. So Starting on about eight years ago, so wait a little while before we started the company, that's when I started sort of individual therapy, also group therapy in a few different environments. And that was kind of my mainstay. Oh, I still am involved in both of those things, you know, eight years later. So doing those, that was sort of a foundational tool, which with individual therapy, I've gone through a lot of therapists and a lot of modalities over time modalities being just like the treatment approach that people use. But I think that most of the time, the last eight years, that's been a one-on-one kind of weekly or every other week therapy. I will make one comment because just in general, it's like I've had a huge amount of privilege to have access and resources to participate in like one-on-one therapy, which not everybody does. However, I will say, especially we didn't take any salary the first like three years that we started the company. So we were living off of savings. It was pretty scary. And I knew I needed to continue therapy. And so I ended up going in the Bay Area asking around and I did find a sliding scale clinic where you gave them your income amounts and they gave you a price back. And it was like, you know, one, I was like 10% of what you would normally pay for therapy. And so there are resources that I was able to take advantage of. And then when I got a real salary later and earn up, then I actually stayed with the same therapist, but paid, you know, market rates for that person. So I just want to encourage people that if they think that cost is the number one barrier, that might be true. I don't know, but I do think in some environments there can be support that's like heavily discounted. So that was a piece of the puzzle. Group therapy in a bunch of environments, I tried all sorts of things, but that was a big piece of the puzzle. And there's all sorts of group therapy, you know, approaches out there. NAMI has groups, there's 12-step groups, there's all sorts of things that you can access. That's been pretty helpful to me on like using those kind of groups once or twice a week. And then about three years in, so maybe like five, six years ago, I started trying with the support of my doctor and then a psychiatrist later, you know, trying different medications to see if they would help. And, you know, there's, I'm always wary to like talk about specific medications because I I can do that, but I don't want to like throw people off on a tangent. Point being like, you know, I asked my doctor what he thought, I gave him my symptoms, asked him what he thought would help. We'd try stuff. That was really scary. I had a huge amount of resistance to starting Uh, psychotropic medication, so medication that affected my mind. And I resisted it for years. And it really helped for a while. So it didn't help right away. For me, it took a path to get used to it and go through side effects. But that was something that helped um, me feel better. And then the other stuff, those are kind of like out there things. But the things that did help when I worked them, and they didn't always was just like exercising a few days a week, which I would go on and off doing. But when I did it, it would feel so much better Uh, meditating, which I, again, would do and then not do. Uh, Thankfully, the last like two years, I've done it pretty consistently. Those are like, you know, big elements and staying away from substances or things that derail me and take me into a dark place. So I was very until about two years ago, I'd gone through a really rough patch of smoking. And that smoking was bad and was bad in one way, but it was the year I was trying to quit and constantly in real in like the withdrawal symptoms from smoking that almost, you know, demolished me. So that wasn't great for my mental health, as an example. So trying to kind of find balance with those things were things that I did try. 
I'm sure I'm missing some other things too, but those are things that have were, were helpful. How dedicated were you to those things or how prevalent were those practices in your life when you went to the emergency room or when you went to inpatient treatment? So yeah, fast, fast forwarding, I think, you know, two years ago was the first time I went to inpatient treatment because I felt like the suicidal ideation was bad. My anxiety was just completely at levels that I hadn't experienced in a long time. I went in for four weeks at an inpatient program that was focused on kind of mental health recovery and trauma work. So focusing on like recovery from like trauma and trying to dig into like older experiences and deeper experiences and figure out like what's going on. So that was an inpatient, my first experience with inpatient programs. It wasn't like a hospitalization environment, hospital environment. It was a, a, but that was kind of, kind of try one. And then over the last two and a half years, I went two other times to these like, oh, they then week long residential programs that were again, more focused on like general mental health and wellness and recovery. So I did some of that. And then I was doing all this stuff to your question. And what happened for me is like, I would still just sort of, my anxiety would just like, I go to one of these programs, I take some time off work, whether it was a week or a few years ago, a month, and I would come back and I'd be pretty engaged. And then things would just eventually at some point start to degrade and degrade where the tools that I had available, which I've talked through, felt like they stopped working. Like my anxiety in this case and the suicidal thoughts and the just feelings of like the panic attacks would just start to grow and become more debilitating. And so that is the cycle that I've had the last few years. So you ask about what led to the emergency room. It kind of was just another one of those cycles. And I don't think that, but it was, I think the things that contributed to it this past year, because I ended up going into like a hospital, my first hospitalization kind of mental health environment, you know, the quote unquote psych ward environment this year, this past August, what led up to that period is like, I was honestly doing all of the things I knew how to do. And I'm really proud of myself for that. But I was going to group therapy sometimes multiple times a day. I was seeing my therapist once or in some cases twice a week. I wasn't using, you know, alcohol or cigarettes or anything, you know, in that period. And at the same time, my anxiety just kept getting worse, feeling more less and less manageable and getting more depressed also. Like my anxiety sort of drives and sort of, you know, it generally then start to feel very depressed. And I think one of the fact that was, so it was part of a repeating cycle, this, what happened, but I also believe the COVID dynamics, the pandemic dynamics, I think made it worse in that I just had much less human contact and resourcing. So nothing, the pandemic didn't create my anxiety or my depression or any of these trends, but the fact that I was living alone and was really pretty cut off, you know, except for this little screen on my computer from humanity. I think really it just augmented things. And I think my de- my when my anxiety started getting really out of hand and these other symptoms and panic effects started coming, I just think I had many less resources around me in terms of like people to normalize and help me feel stable. And that precipitated in just this really scary descent over the course of a few days where I didn't know what else to do. And so I had never gone to the hospital, like the emergency room, but I knew that was an option. So I actually called the suicide, the national like suicide hotline because these suicidal thoughts were getting really loud and I was getting really scared. And I talked to them and they said, you know, they gave me a few options of things I could do, one of which was going to the emergency room. And I kind of thought about it and I was feeling very desperate and really scared of like, what I might do to myself. And so I literally just went to the closest Kaiser was my HMO at that time, or still is. And so I went to the closest Kaiser emergency room. And it happened to be I was actually traveling my first time traveling in the pandemic at that point. So I was actually in near Portland, Oregon. So I was like in the suburbs of Portland, I ended up going to an emergency room there, very shaky, and stayed overnight there. And then they recommended you know, we, I chatted with a, ther- a psychiatrist or therapist, whatever, whoever they had come in to evaluate me. And they recommended this inpatient, basically, facility that they had on site. And 
I didn't, again, very much like, I think this is a theme of these stories. I didn't know what else to do, but I trusted this doctor they had there and I liked her, like her energy and I trusted her recommendation. So I went inpatient for about nine days. Uh, at that point, it's kind of a locked ward environment, which was fine by me. It was like, when it's when I'm ready to come out, I'm sure it will work out. And it was in that kind of week plus of being there that I decided I wasn't going to do what I'd done before, which is get help, get residential treatment, take time off, and then jump back in. I just energetically decided that time while I was inside, it wasn't clear right away, but over the few days, I was like, you know what? I don't think I'm going to do it anymore. Wow. That's interesting to me. You know, one of the things I hear in this story is that it's it's okay to need help even when you're doing all the right things or seemingly doing all the right things because you're, you're going to meetings, you're going to uh, groups, you're going to therapy, you're checking all the boxes, but you still were in, in dire need of help. And uh, your story tells me it's okay uh, to need more help, even if you're kind of doing what you're supposed to do. That's powerful to me. Yeah, thanks for saying that. It's I feel like I'm like tearing up a bit just like thinking about like how fucking hard I was trying, you know? Like I was really trying to work the things that had been working. And it just feels hard to have all those tools and be doing them and still feel like you're coming apart. And I think that so for people out there that may be having that experience, like, yeah, I hope, I hope you feel seen and heard in that. It's, it was really tough. And I think I'm a slow learner, but, you know, stepping down from full-time executive work, <laughs> it's another experiment. Like all of this is an experiment, but it's just like, maybe this will help. You know, maybe that will help. Maybe this will help. Like, and I am really pleased with the mental health that I've been able to achieve the last few months with that space. But you don't know until you try it. You know, I tried other things like eight years ago, I quit my job and I was still totally miserable. Like that wasn't the solution, you know? And so I am very, generally really frustrated because of how my personality works, Stephen, with like how arbitrary all this mental health stuff can feel. And I still struggle with that like the therapeutic approaches and the medication approaches, like it kind of feels like throwing darts at a dartboard sometimes. And I struggle with that. And at the same time, I guess what I tell myself and I would want anybody else out there to hear is like, you're worth it. Like you're worth trying and like trust in yourself and believe in the people around you that you, you know, you can trust and just keep trying. And I believe people can get a lot of recovery. I believe people can stay alive and can live beautiful lives. It's just, it's not a one plus one equals two solution for a lot of people. And I think from your story, Stephen, that's, you know, similar. Yeah. What can we be doing as an ecosystem, you know, of founders and investors and, you know, what can we be doing to support entrepreneurs? How can we make this better? Because, I mean, you've seen the statistics. I mean, it's, it's a significantly high percentage of entrepreneurs that have or are directly impacted by mental health. I mean, 72% according to the NIMH and according to Dr. Michael Freeman, it's, you know, entrepreneurs are 10 X more likely to have a major mood disorder, six X more likely ADHD, two X more likely to suffer from depression. And this is versus the, 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 the standard population of, of, of everyone else. So we've got to, as an ecosystem of founders, of investors, of, of people in startup land, we've got to do better than what we're doing. And what, what is that going to look like? Yeah. So it's a good question. At an intimate level, I feel like founders like you or I have a unique ability to speak in this forum or in a phone call or whatever it is with other people who are founding businesses. And so I think having forums like this, having more people publish their stories and just talk about these things, whether that's just to one person or like, you know, I've chosen to do, or you've chosen to Stephen and put this stuff out there more generally, I do believe strong or people just posting on their Facebook, you know, to their friends and family. I think that people just talking about their struggles in real time or things that have happened in the past is really empowering and helps other people feel seen and gives other people language to express what's happening to them. And that's certainly been a big part of my journey. Another piece that I think is just how we relate to each other as founders 
I think is also important. And probably if you are a friend or a family member of people that are working, you know, in startups or starting businesses, you know, having your first question be, you know, how are you as opposed to how's the business is a big difference. And I've made that shift progressively over the last year or two with the founders I work with, where I really do try to just ask how people are doing and create space that there are people around us that care about us as people separate from the companies that we're working on. And at least in my case, it was a lot of times I just assumed everybody thought those two were the same thing. I don't actually think that's necessarily the case, but you need those reminders and you need peers and people that you respect showing interest in you as a human being. And so such as we can do that, I think that also helps. I love that. I also think, I think just sharing our stories, I think you sharing your story is huge. I'd like to see more entrepreneurs come out and share their story and they don't even have to wait until they've, you know, gotten everything figured out to do it. I think just, you know, the way we talk about some people post about, I went to the gym and I, or I ran four miles and I was the fastest I ever did it. I, I think the way we, we've normalized talking about our physical health, I think just normalizing the way we talk about our mental health is, is a huge part of it. And I think that sort of resonates with what you said about using these forums to, to share our stories. So it's, you know, it's, I think that's huge. And, you know, one thing for me is a lot of people that I talk to, because I mean, I'm in this space, a lot of people do start the conversation with how are you doing? And, and one of the things where I make the biggest mistake in my day is when, when I hear someone ask me, how are you doing? Honestly, man, sometimes I just think they're asking me that because I'm the like bipolar guy. And then and I'm like, okay, okay. All right. Like, you don't have to treat me like I'm handicapped here. It's okay. Like I can, I can, I'm all right. And that's not them. That's me. And I'm like in the best condition mentally I've been in in decades. And I still really fucking struggle when people ask me how I'm doing, to be honest, to be honest. I mean, that to just, we've got to create a better environment where people are encouraged to be honest because I don't know, in those moments when you're not thinking about it and someone asks you how you're doing, I mean, I still, I still am like, oh, no, no, I'm fine. Let me, let me just, I got to get these investors. I got to get these dollars. I got to get this. I got to get that. I suck at it, man. <laughs> and I, I spend all day, every day talking about it and thinking about it and working on it. Well, yeah, I think that it, it is a process. I think, I almost said process because I'm up here in Canada now. We speak <laughs> differently. I think that the stories piece is so powerful and I totally agree. You know, I wrote about this in the courts, like the, the kind of blog post that I did too. It's so common for people to take space when they have physical ailments and that's great, right? Like I have cancer or I'm sick, I'm staying home for the day, you know, like I have the flu and I would just love for us as founders for ourselves and the sake of our companies and to create a transformation, I think, in the broader you know, world and economy where we can talk in the same ways and give ourselves the same compassion and space around just saying like, hey, I'm, no, my head's not in a good space today or I'm having these kind of symptoms and that can be okay. And not having it be okay to not be okay, which I think is how I felt for a large portion of my work life pre startup and post startup, it's not a loving way to hold ourselves. And it's not a loving way to hold our staff. And it creates a lot of suffering. And in my case, I just even when I would have given other people more space, I was not a standard I, I kind of helped to believe that I was responsible for keeping all this stuff together. So I think that people telling their stories is important. I think that catching base with each other and finding out how trying to find safe people that you can talk with and hold each other accountable for things like exercise or time with family or whatever the things are that help you or me feel like full-fledged human beings. I think those can make a difference. I don't know. Maybe that is how transformations are made. I'm not totally sure. But having founders just talking about the therapy they're doing or the meds they're taking or the places that they're going to get help, I think those things kind of create a shift where we start to be able to see that founders and executives, you know, are just 
have the same ability to be vulnerable and open as everyone else. And I pray that that also creates room for people at all levels of organization to do similar things, that it's hard to do that when leadership is not showing that vulnerability. It's a lot harder for people you know, across the organization to take the space they need and to voice their own concerns. I agree with you. I mean, that's that's very well said. And I, I appreciate the the way you articulate that. I appreciate the you being vulnerable and sharing your thoughts on this. I think the most powerful part of this conversation as we kind of get to the end of our time here is the conversation itself. It's just the fact that, you know, you've got two entrepreneurs, you've got some sitting here talking about our own mental health and the struggles we've had. And I'd love to see more of that in any forum, anywhere. I totally agree. I mean, I've had immense privileges in life in terms of like money and having a lot of family members engage with mental health supports of their own long before I did, you know, that created permission silently or not silently for me to get help. And maybe some of those things are the reason I'm alive today. So I just want to like acknowledge that I have through all of this, like I have a lot that's been going for me and I, I am really grateful for that. And I'm grateful to be alive and present, you know, here with you um, and whoever's listening. So I don't know, I suspect in the show notes or whatever, we can put my Twitter stuff and whatever, you know, contact info if people want to reach out. Absolutely. We'll link to the link to your, I'm going to link to your blog post, LinkedIn, Twitter, everything. Is there anything else you'd, you'd like to share with, with folks, a, a way to get in touch with you, a way to reach out? Let me know and I'll be sure to include it. Yeah, I will put some just like Twitter and stuff on there. I don't, I'm not on that many platforms. Social media is a, is a, is a, is a dangerous place for people with a mind like mine, but uh, it's also a really powerful place to reach people. So no, I'm incredibly grateful. And I, I really, I guess all I would say, you know, is ask for help, reach out a hand. And my experience has been when I reach out and ask and keep asking, I keep getting different types of support, but those supports over time are the things that have helped me to stay alive and actually start to thrive and find a lot of joy in living. So I want that for all of us and especially for all the the founders out there who are really just so passionate in building something new and better in the world. I pray that they can do that, you know, while finding uh, the support they need to take care of themselves. Absolutely. I mean, my hope is that founders can understand that they, they have these amazing qualities and benefits and of some of the things, these traits in their lives, and they're, they're helping them to build these amazing things that help people and make life better for everyone. But there's also downsides to these traits. I mean, you talked about it very early on in, in your story about, you know, there was all this super high intensity, but married with it was the, these, the eating disorder, the depression and the, and the compulsive behavior. And, and I, I just want to make founders aware that it's, it's, it's okay to be super high achieving and awesome, but just take a moment sometimes to recognize that there's a downside to some of that and you need to, you need to do something about it and it's okay to ask for help. Yeah. And I'll just say on that point, I know we're close to time here, but like my experience of the last like eight years is that, or, you know, since I started getting into recovery work is that I was able to show up for my company in ways I never would have been able to without getting that help. So I think I would have had a lot of anxiety early on that if I got into therapy, for example, I would just have to like, you know, hide in a corner and never work again or never work a high stress job. And that wasn't my experience. Yes, I chose to step down now, you know, at this point, but I've had a number of years of just helping to build a really amazing business that I don't believe I would have been able to show up for in any way without, you know, a really broad type of mental health treatment and support. So I don't know, I just would hate for a founder to leave this feeling like, hey, you have to quit your job to get feel better, you know, or give up in your company. Although that's a choice I chose to do many years after EarnUp started, you know, to take to step back, the supports I had were the things that allowed me, I think, to be a good boss, be a caring sort of coworker, and help drive the mission of the company that I was building forward. So I hope people can find that there's a balance there that works for for all of them. Awesome. Well look, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you again, like I said at the beginning, for for sharing your story for being vulnerable with us, for uh, 
everything you've done. I, I really believe you may have, I'm sure you've seen a lot of responses to the blog post and to, you know, posting on LinkedIn and, and, and sharing your story. But I believe that your story has second and third order effects that you'll never hear about, you'll never know about. But I guarantee you that sharing that story has helped a lot of people. So thank you for doing that. Thank you very much, Stephen. And um, I'm just I'm grateful to have a forum like this, and I'm glad that it exists. So keep up the good work. I want to say another very special thank you, Matthew, for being here today and sharing with us. I think your vulnerability and your courage will light the way for many entrepreneurs who need to get help and help them to find it. And I applaud that. It's truly amazing. To our listeners, thank you for being here. And normally at this point, I'd ask you for something like a like or a share on social media, but that doesn't even feel like it's okay today. Please, if you do anything after hearing this, go find a friend, find a founder, go ask someone how they're doing, go check in with someone and share about how you're doing. Just stop and pause and breathe and ask for help. It's totally cool. We've all had to do it. We're all going to need to do it again. And it's normal. So please do it. That's it. Thank you for being here. Please share this message. There is hope for you. We can all be well. Thank you for being here.